السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والجنة للموحدين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين والصلاة والسلام على السراج المنير البشير النذير محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كلامه القديم والسابقون الأولون من المهاجرين والأنصار والذين اتبعوهم بإحسان رضي الله عنهم وردوا عنه وعد لهم جنات تجري تحتها الأنهار خالدين فيها أبدا ذلك الفوز العظيم وقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم خير الناس قرني ثم الذين يلونهم ثم الذين يلونهم Honorable ulama, respected elders, dearest brothers in Islam, we begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the exalted, the glorious, the majestic, the one and the only, the one who turns night into day and day into night. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send the best of his blessings and salutations upon the best of his creation. Our master, alayhi wa sallam, bless each and every one of his sahaba, to bless each and every one of us who lead a righteous life. Dearest brothers in Islam, dearest sisters watching at home, Alhamdulillah, we have embarked on this journey of learning and deriving lessons from the life of Umar radiallahu anhu. At the blink of an eye, the month of Ramadan has passed and we are here in our third session of this series. It is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has made us capable to come to the masjid while fasting at this precious, auspicious time and learn a few things about his deen. This is nothing that is from our capability, our power. It is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine decree and him choosing us that we have been able to attend this masjid and sit in this gathering of ilm. Alhamdulillah, all praises to Allah. Nevertheless, my dear brothers in Islam, sisters in Islam, we, alhamdulillah, have completed three sessions. The first session, we discussed about the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, their virtues. Then we discussed how Umar, radiallahu anhu's life was before Islam. And uh, we demystified a mystery. And that is that Umar, radiallahu anhu, buried his daughter alive, which is a blatant, fabricated lie, a blatant fabricated lie. And in the second session last week, we discussed how Umar radiallahu anhu embraced Islam, how his embracing Islam was an important turning point 
for the Muslimin. It was in fact a victory for the Muslimin. The Muslimin could openly practice Islam. And we also discussed how Umar radiallahu anhu was the first person who made hijrah and he announced his hijrah. He went to the Kaaba, he spoke to the leaders, the chieftains of Quraysh, and he said, I am going to make hijrah. If any one of you has a problem, if he wants his mother to lose his child, if he wants his child to become an orphan, or if he wants his wife to be widowed, come behind this valley, meet me, let's engage in arguing in a one-on-one -on -one clash, and then we'll see who comes up, and I will make my hijrah. No one from the Quraysh dared to go and meet Umar radiallahu anhu behind the valley. This was his power. This was his capability. And this was the daraja, the status Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him. Nevertheless, today, thereafter, in the last session, we also discussed a few virtues of Umar radiallahu anhu. Out of those virtues, one was Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam very clearly he said to Umar radiallahu anhu, O Umar, if you were to tread a path, if you were to walk down one lane, shaitan would flee away from that lane. And he also said, لَوْ كَانَ بَعْدِي نَبِيٌّ لَكَانَ عُمَرٌ If there was a prophet after me, it would have been Umar. These were the few virtues, virtues we described last week. And today we'll delve into a few more virtues. And then we'll see how Umar radiallahu anhu, he carried out himself how he supported the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after embracing Islam. So generally, you see today's politicians as well, even maybe the president, they might have a few close ministers, close allies. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, مَا مِن نَبِيٍ إِلَّا وَلَهُ وَزِيرَانِ مِنْ أَهْلِ السَّمَاءِ There is no prophet that has been sent by Allah except that he has appointed for that prophet two representatives, two ministers, if you will, from the skies, referring to the angels. Who are those two? Jibreel and Mikail, alayhi salam. And Allah appoints two important representatives for that prophet in the world as well. Who are the two representatives of the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the dunya? Umar radiallahu anhu and before him, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and Umar radiallahu anhu. This is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying this. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam likens Umar radiallahu anhu to the stars in the sky. Certain stars, they are clearly visible. Certain other stars, they are not that very clearly visible. The status in the sky. This is his rank. And um, generally, when there was a gathering, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would be focused on his mission, on proclaiming and propagating his message. So he would not smile at anyone unnecessarily. But when Umar and Abu, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would smile at them and they would smile at him. And <clears throat> one day, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he came to the masjid. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was on his right. Umar radiallahu anhu was on his left. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is leaning his hands. He's resting in his hands. The right hand on Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. The left hand on Umar radiallahu anhu. And he proclaims to the Sahaba, O oh my Sahaba, this is how we will be resurrected on the day of Qiyamah. On the day of Qiyamah, Everyone will be running here and there, looking to increase their deeds, looking to somehow peep into Jannah. Whilst the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will be resurrected along with Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu on his right and Umar radiallahu anhu on his left. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asks Jibreel alayhi salam, O oh Jibreel, Describe to me the virtues of Umar radiallahu anhu. Describe to me the virtues. Who is asking this? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa The greatest person to walk on the earth. He's asking whom? The greatest? 
angel, O Jibreel, explain to me. This alayhi salam says, if I was to relate to you the virtues of Umar, the virtues of Umar are so many that I would not be able to complete the virtues of Umar even if I was given the time from Nuh alayhi salam till now. Adam alayhi salam, Nuh alayhi salam, the second prophet. Over oh, 900,000 years ago, 900 to 1,000 years ago, Nuh alayhi salam might have lived. From that time to today, if I was to relate to you the virtues of Umar, I will complete the virtues of Umar radiallahu These are the virtues of Umar radiallahu anhu. And then we know in today's day and age, um, generally the matters related to the deen are constricted or restricted to the learned, to the ulama, to the ulama. And from the ulama, when it comes to day-to-day -day rulings, day-to-day -day rulings relating to ibadat, mu'asharat, mu'amalat, our dealings, our day-to-day -day life, we generally consult the muftis because the mufti has been uh, specialized training to issue verdicts, to issue fatawa, so that the person who has inquired from him gets a proper, which is in line with the teachings of Islam. So, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, he says that he was asked, who used to give verdict, who used to issue fatawa when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was alive? Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu says, Abu Bakr and Umar. Even the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the person to whom wahi came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is alive, he is walking amongst the Sahaba, but he has given permission to Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhu to issue fatawa. So these two Sahaba radiallahu anhuma are not ordinary people. These are the cream of the Sahaba, the best of the Sahaba. And today we get groups, they put down Umar radiallahu anhu, they put down Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, they say they don't deserve the Khilafah. Listen to what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has to say. Hubbu Abi Bakr wa Umar Iman. You want to complete your Iman, you want to become a complete mu'min. What do you need to do? Yes, you need to testify that there is no God but Allah and that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his messenger. Along with that, you need to have love for Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and Umar. Why? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Hubbu Abu Bakr wa Umar. Iman. Loving Abu Bakr and Umar is Iman. Bughdu Abu Bakr wa Umar. Kufrun. A person puts down and amount to disbelief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that was about the virtues of Umar radiallahu anhu and Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he says, لو أن علم عمر وضع في كفة ميزان The ilm of Umar radiallahu anhu, how great was his knowledge, the level of his knowledge. If the knowledge of Umar radiallahu anhu was placed on one side of the scale and the knowledge of everyone in the world was placed on the other side of the scale, لَرَجَّحَ عِلْمُ عُمَرْ بِعِلْمِهِمْ The ilm of Umar radiallahu anhu would be greater than the ilm of the whole world. So these were a little bit of the virtues of Umar radiallahu anhu. And you see Umar radiallahu anhu also had been granted firasa. What is firasa? Insight. For example, Imam Abu Hanifa the great Imam Abu Hanifa, rahmatullahi alayhi, when people made wudu, people perform ablution, Imam Abu Hanifa was bestowed from Allah with the gift that he could see the sins of people falling. For example, if I was to make wudu, if I was to perform wudu, and Imam Abu Hanifa was here, he would see my sins falling away. Why? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, each wudu, is a purification from the sins. So similarly, Umar radiallahu anhu also had been granted the ilm 
of cash ilm of firasa he had sent an army to fight a certain group when they were about to be defeated he makes an ishara from the member and tables turn events turn a turn of events takes place and the muslim army emerges victorious nevertheless my dear brothers in islam these were the virtues of umar radiyallahu anhu and from the greatest and grandest of his virtues is that umar radiyallahu anhu was given hikma from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and knowledge from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would come he would seek counsel of the sahaba ya sahaba this issue has come to us what do you think what is your opinion now umar radiyallahu anhu would give an opinion sometimes the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would even go ahead and take the other opinion but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reveal it down ayas ya rasulullah umar radiyallahu anhu's opinion is the right way to go forward we will delve into these examples now examples and instances where the verses of quran coincided with the opinion of umar radiyallahu anhu for example in the hajj of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam umar radiyallahu anhu suggests ya rasulullah we have performed tawaf now it is time to pray the two rak'at after tawaf are we clear are, we, are you with me there are two rak'at after tawaf isn't it two rak'at which are sunnah to be prayed two naf to be prayed ya rasulullah we are going to pray this let us pray this behind the maqam of ibrahim what is the maqam of ibrahim the footsteps of ibrahim alayhi salam from where he built the kaaba in the haram in masjid al haram right behind the kaaba there are the footsteps of the ibrahim prophet ibrahim alayhi salam which are framed in a gold box like thing umar radiyallahu anhu says ya rasulullah after tawaf this is the best place to pray our sunnahs what happens next allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals down verses wattakhidu <coughs> وَاتَّخِذُوا مِن مَّقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ مُصَلَّى O Prophet, after you've done your rituals, go behind مَقَام إِبْرَاهِيمَ Go at the place where Ibrahim alayhi salam's footsteps are there and pray your two rak'at. Event number one where Umar radiyallahu anhu's opinion coincides with the Qur'an. And next, Umar radiyallahu anhu he comes to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam alhamdulillah this is the first time three sessions first parking problem we are improving alhamdulillah c a d 5994 c a d 5994 there is no embarrassment in standing may allah reward the brother and this is human errors human issues logistical issues May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward the brother. He immediately got up and went to move the vehicle. Alhamdulillah. Nevertheless, Umar radiallahu anhu comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, Ya Rasulullah, yadukhulu ala nisaika al-barru wal-fajir. Falaw amartahunna yahtajibna. O Rasulullah, O the Messenger of Allah, your wives are our mothers. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's wives are the mothers of the believers, ummahatul mu'minin. Ya Rasulullah, any person fulan fulan he comes, he enters into your house and starts speaking to your wives. This is not good for your ghayra. This is not good for your honor, Ya Rasulullah. Why don't you command them to adopt the hijab, adopt the Muslim veil, to start wearing the abaya, start covering? properly according to the islamic teachings now the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he is waiting for revelation umar has suggested this allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately reveals kull lil mu'minin yaghuddu min absarihim wa yahfadu furujahum allah does not start with the women yes that is the main issue being addressed here the hijab of the women but before addressing that issue allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says oh the messenger of allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam proclaim to the believers ay yaghuddu kull al mu'minin yaghuddu min absarihim tell them 
to lower their gaze to lower their gaze wa yahfadu furujahum and to protect their private parts the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in a hadith he says man yadman li ma bayna lahyayhi wa ma bayna faqidayhi adman lahu aljanna the person who guarantees for me that he will guarantee he will control what is between his two jaws and what is between his two thighs referring to the private parts i guarantee for him jannah i guarantee for him jannah so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also in this verse commands the muslimin lower your gaze there is a cause of fitna here there is a lady who might be attractive passing from here don't stare like you are looking at a wonder of this world no lower your gaze immediately lower your gaze immediately don't keep staring this is the teaching of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and then he addresses the females whatever it may be the environment you are living it may it may be a non muslim country we can go controlling each and every one how they dress how their attire is given the rates at which the fitna is prevalent in today's times you can go and control them what you can and what you have to do is lower your gaze this is your hijab my dear brother in islam then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wa qul lil mu'minati yaghdudna min absarihinna wa yahfadna furujahunna wa la yubdina zinatahunna illa ma dhahara minha wa yadribna bi khumurihinna ala juyubihin and proclaim to the believing women ya rasulullah these are the ayat of hijab these are the ayat which made the abaya the hijab the proper islamic covering compulsory allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and proclaim to the believing women even for the women lowering the gaze is important that is why allah mentions that before mentioning about the hijab he says tell them to lower their gazes it is not only for the women for the men even the women they need to lower their gaze yaghdudna min absarihinna wa yahfadna furujuhunna they need to protect their private parts wa la yubdina zinatahunna and they should not expose their beauty their adornment illa ma dhahara minha except for what becomes apparent they are rough wa yadribna bi khumurihinna ala juyubihinna and they should cover themselves with the scarf or the cloak to the extent that their chest is also covered to the extent that their chest is also covered this is the aya of hijab and it came down after the suggestion of after the suggestion of umar radiyallahu anhu so item number 2 second instance where umar radiyallahu anhu is in line with the quran the ayah is revealed according to the thinking of umar radiyallahu anhu and my dear brothers in islam the sight allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us is actually a great ni'mah you know the sight the sight the eye the eye itself you just even put your finger on your eye your eye will close automatically it is so sensitive and look how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed this wall of flesh into the eye into the socket the bones are created in such a way that they protect the area of the eye the socket of the eye and above all the eye is the doorway to your heart your eye is the door pathway to your heart the more you look at evil things the more your heart is going to die the more you start staring at non mahram women the more you start scrolling on instagram watching reels which have non mahram women listening to music your heart is going to die and there will no way, there will be no way to awaken your heart other than by the zikr of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says la tutbi'in nadrata an nadrata after you have glanced at a non mahram women by mistake now don't follow that glance up by keeping glancing by keeping on glancing at her one was by mistake immediately as you glance you should move your face away 
If you keep on glancing at her, keep on looking at her, then you are sinful. فَإِنَّمَا لَكَ الْأُولَى The first glance, you are excused. But then, it is all from shaitan, and it is because of your sins. It is said that the sight is a poisoned arrow. A poison arrow from the arrows of shaitan. The one who starts looking at unnecessary things and doesn't lower his gaze, Iman will slowly go away, start going away from his heart. So protecting the eyes is extremely necessary. And my dear sisters listening, observing the rules of hijab is also extremely necessary. Hijab it doesn't mean you are covered from head to toe, but your figure, your shape, your body shape is clearly visible. No. Hijab does not mean you wear tight clothing. Hijab means you wear loose fitting clothing. And a person looking at you does not fall into the trap of the devil by looking at you. And your shape, the figure of your body is not visible through the hijab. That is hijab. Dear sisters in Islam, today we might be struggling with the hijab. We might not have the headscarf on our heads. Start with the headscarf. Start with the headscarf. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will slowly help you to observe the proper hijab. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for our sisters and help us rectify our intentions. Nevertheless, with regard to the sight, an interesting narration has been mentioned by Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. Ibn Abbas radiallahu my dear brothers, please come forward and join the gathering. Inshallah, it will be a means of increase in barakah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. Come forward and join the gathering, inshallah. The closer we are, the closer our hearts will be. If you need to lean on the wall, if you have a back issue, then you are excused, inshallah. Khair. Nevertheless, my dear brothers in Islam, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, he narrates this incident. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is on the camel. And who is riding with him on the camel? The brother of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. Fadl ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. The Prophet and him are riding. Now a lady suddenly comes. And she starts asking the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya Rasulallah, my father is too old. My father is too frail. How do I perform? Is it permissible for me to perform the hajj on his behalf? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, yes, your father is too old. You can go and perform your hajj on his behalf. His hajj on his behalf. While this exchange of thoughts takes place, while this conversation is taking place, Fadl ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu was a youngster. He was a youngster. He starts looking at this lady. He starts glancing at this lady. And he starts becoming infatuated by her. Now this lady also starts looking at him. There is exchange of glances from this side and from the other side. Like what happens in today's times. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum were also human. Were also human. They too had feelings. Today our youngsters go for tuition classes. And then what, ha what starts with a small glance ends up into a conversation and the conversation transforms into a deeper conversation and the deeper conversation transforms into touching and Allah forbid it ends up into a dirty evil reality. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our youngsters from the fitna that lead to zina and from zina itself. So Fadl ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, if you were, if one of our fathers, uncles was in that place, what would they do? Illa masha'Allah. Fadl, don't you have shame? Fadl, don't you have shame? You're looking at this lady openly like this. Stop looking at her like this. What did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do? Adabu tarbiya, adabu ta'deeb, how to... Inculcate etiquettes into a youngster, my dear parents watching at home. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam slowly moved the face of Fadl ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu to the other side. 
No one knew that Fadl ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu was looking at her. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Today if we see someone doing this, what would we do? Oh Fadl, what are you doing? The whole world would come to know. But what did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do? He slowly moved the face of Fadl radiallahu anhu. Fadl radiallahu anhu realized that he has committed a mistake and he too moved away. So we learn how to correct others and we also learn from this incident that even the Sahaba radiallahu anhum fell. So we human beings are weaker than the Sahaba. Our iman cannot be even close to the iman of the Sahaba by even a grain. So how much protection we need to take, how much precautions we need to take. A blind Sahabi, Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum radiallahu anhu, he was also the Mu'addin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Sahabi is blind. The wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if I'm not mistaken, it was Ummu Salama radiallahu anha. She and another wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they do not observe hijab. They say he's a blind Sahabi. It's, it's all right. No worries. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam immediately says, Ihtajiba, go don your hijab. They ask the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, but he's blind. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asks them, definitely he is blind, but are you all blind? But are you both blind? But this hadith shows that even in the presence of the blind sahabi, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had that protective feeling for his wives, which is lacking today. Which is lacking today. Today, alhamdulillah, the brother comes, prays, fassaf, goes in the path of Allah. Alhamdulillah, he is always engaged in the dhikr of Allah. Go to his house. His son is engaged in listening to music, maybe even substance abuse. His wife, the women of his household, do not observe hijab. Where is the protective jealousy today? That protective feeling where the man should be protective for his women. Allah Ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu ku anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. Like the air crew explains to us when we are about to take off on a flight journey. Firstly, wear your own oxygen mask and then put it on your child. Allah Subhanahu perhaps they have derived inspiration from the Quran. Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala also says, Oh, you who believe, you bring in taqwa. Protect yourself from the fire and also protect the protect your family. Today, alhamdulillah, we are protecting ourselves from the fire. We are coming to the mosque, praying five times, doing the ibadah, fasting. We are always in the path of Allah. But what about our women folk at home? Are they observing the proper hijab? Are they leaving and traveling without a mahram? These things need to be checked, my dear brothers in Islam. And my dear sisters in Islam, with regard to these things, you need to cooperate. You need to cooperate. In the name of feminism, in the name of equal rights, what has the West done to all? It has taken our society, it has taken our society and squeezed out all the shame from the society. And in the name of development, in the name of going forward, they promote feminism and put half-naked women on the billboards. This is not Islam, my dear brothers in Islam. My dear sisters in Islam, we need to think of this. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, you all need to observe hijab. You, are, you, you all both are not blind, even though he is blind. In another narration, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Al-ghayratu min al-eeman, wal-madha'u min al-nifaq. Al-ghayra, protectiveness over your women folk, over your family, is from iman. Today, my dear brother, my dear youngster, your father wants you to report to him each and every one of your action. 
know that your father is filled with iman wal madau min al nifaq if your father was kafri wal madau madha refers to inviting women inviting men and allowing them to freely mix today in the name of iftar events what happens men and women mix freely enjoy themselves this is from nifaq from hypocrisy alhamdulillah we will worship the month of ramadan and then when eid comes back to our old habits mixing freely with the women some people think the women in their house all of them are mahrams in people living in extended families your brother's wife is not mahram to you you should not be freely engaging with her if i'm not mistaken the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam even has mentioned a sihru an nar being freely mixing and intermingling with the in laws who are not mahram will lead to entry into jahannam will lead to entry into jahannam nevertheless this is not our discussion for today we are discussing instances where umar radiyallahu anhu gave an opinion and ayat of the quran came down confirming the opinion of umar radiyallahu anhu number one was anyone from the audience number one was ah uh, we are asleep yes maqam ibrahim ma sha allah number two hijab very good now comes number three scholars say there are almost 21 instances 21 instances where umar radiyallahu anhu and the quran coincided number 3 the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as we all know he had multiple wives he would go to their house and visit them one such day after asr salah the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam goes to the house of zainab radiyallahu an he goes there he spends a little extra time than usual over there and he also eats a little bit of honey at the house of zainab radiyallahu anha the other wives you know co-wife jealousy envy they are a little disturbed namely aisha radiyallahu anha the daughter of abu bakr radiyallahu anhu and hafsa radiyallahu anha the daughter of umar radiyallahu anhu they are a little disturbed with the other wives they plan when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam comes he has spent more time at zainab radiyallahu anha's house when he comes what we will do is we will say that there is an odor coming from his mouth we will tell him that there is a evil bad unpleasant odor coming emitting from his mouth now the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam comes they ask the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam ya rasulullah what is this unpleasant odor coming from your mouth have you eaten maghafir maghafir was an olden day herb a herb those who are into ayurveda and all would know the ayurveda the medicine is effective but to consume that and um use that is a task on its own the stench it gives so a herb they asked the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam ya rasulullah did you eat maghafir a herb which has an unpleasant smell prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says no i haven't eaten maghafir the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam even would stay away from onions and garlic why he did not want to have that unpleasant odor in his mouth because he would be frequently conversing with the angels so as to not displease the angels and chase them away the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would not even consume garlic and onion now the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam explains to them no i haven't had maghafir but i had a little bit of honey i had a little bit of honey now the wives they say ya rasul allah perhaps the honey you had was extracted from a honey bee who went and sucked onto the herb of maghafir of this unpleasant plant and drank its nectar how is that plan this is what women can do when they are disturbed don't disturb your women khair what do the wife say perhaps ya rasul allah you have drunk you have consumed honey from a 
that is extracted from a honey bee which had sucked on to the nectar of this magafir herb. That is why there is this foul smell emitting from your mouth. What happens next? The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he is saddened. Why? Again, conversing with the malaika, angels, that link should not be disturbed. Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, "I am promising now." That from today, I am not going to consume honey anymore. Fair enough. Why? Because he thought the honey gave that unpleasant order. But he also requested the other wives, Aisha radiallahu anha and Hafsa radiallahu anha, please don't tell this to Zainab. Because Zainab gave me the honey. If you go and tell her that this foul smell was coming from my mouth because of the honey that I consumed at her place, she is going to be saddened. Don't tell her. Keep this as a secret. But eventually the secret got leaked. The secret got leaked. And it went to Zainab radiallahu anha. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saddened. Umar radiallahu anhu gets to know this. He gets to know this. His daughter also is involved. He goes to the Ummahatul Mu'mineen, the wives of the Prophets. He says, please stop hurting my Nabi. Please stop hurting my Nabi immediately. If you don't stop hurting them, hurting him, perhaps Allah will replace you and grant him new wives who will be better than you. This is an ultimatum from Umar radiallahu anhu. Fearless, the mothers of the believers. The wives of the Prophet, he goes them up front, hands on. He says, stop hurting my Nabi. Perhaps Allah will replace you with other women and grant those other women the honor of being the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately reveals down. Asa rabbuhu in talaqa kunna an yubdilhu azwajan khayran minkun. Perhaps your Lord will replace for you better spouses and grant you better wives who will be better than them after you divorce them. After you divorce them. Now the wives are taken aback and they stop what they were doing. So here also what happens? Umar radiallahu anhu gives an opinion and ayat are revealed which coincide with the opinion of Umar radiallahu anhu. Number three is done. Number four. At the Battle of Badr, what happened? There was this issue of what to do with the captives. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asks mashwara from the Sahaba. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu gives another mashwara. Umar radiallahu anhu has another mashwara. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam being the kind-hearted person he was, he didn't want to punish them. So he goes with the mashwara of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, Allah reveals the word, Ya Rasulullah, you should deal with them in the way Umar has suggested. Number four. Number five. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals this verse. وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ سُلَالَةٍ مِنْ طِينٍ How has man been created? Today man boasts. He is at the peak of technology. He is at the peak of technology. He has done all developments possible. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds you and me. You might be at the forefront in terms of science, technology, business, economics. But know that we have created you from extracted clay. Clay, mud. Immediately after listening to this verse, Umar radiallahu anhu says, فَتَبَارَكَ اللَّهُ أَحْسَنُ الْخَالِقِينَ Glory be to Allah. Glory be to Allah. He is the most perfect of creators. He is the most perfect of creators. Later on, two verses pass. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself reveals the statement of Umar radiallahu anhu as a verse in the Quran. We are created with clay and our reality is we are going back to clay. Today we boast. We have the best watch on our wrist. We drive the best car. But are you going to take this car and this watch into your grave? No, it will be you, your iman, your amal. So work on your iman, 
and your amal. Another instance, the sixth instance. There are 21 instances, but we will restrict it to seven. The sixth instance, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who knows who was the leader of the munafiqeen? Leader of the munafiqeen, anyone knows the name? Ra'isul munafiqeen? Yes, my dear brother. Abu Sufyan, radiyallahu anhu, he was a sahab. No, no, leader of the munafiqeen, leader of the hypocrites. Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, very good. Ra'isul munafiqeen. He acted like he's a Muslim, but deep down he was a kafir. He even accused our mother, Aisha radiyallahu anha, of evil things. But Allah revealed verses for her also defending Aisha radiyallahu anha. So Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, he has died. He is dead. People from his clan come to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they say, Ya Rasulullah, why don't you come and lead his janazah? Why don't you come and lead his janazah? Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, again, the kind-hearted, the man whose heart was filled with mercy, he obliges, why, if I lead his janazah, probably different um, groups of munafiqeen will be attracted to Islam and they will embrace Islam. He's about to lead his janazah, he's standing at the chest of Abdullah ibn Ubay. Umar radiallahu anhu comes and he says, Ya Rasulullah, you are going to pray the janazah prayer on the enemy of Allah, on this enemy of Allah. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is now waiting for wahi. He's waiting for revelation from whom? From Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala reveals verses. وَلَا تُصَلِّ عَلَىٰ أَحَدٍ مِّنْهُمْ مَا تَأَبَدًا Don't pray upon these munafiqeen when they die. Any of the munafiqeen. Again, the opinion of Umar radiallahu anhu and the ayat of the Qur'an go inside. This is not any normal feat. The Qur'an, the verses, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are coinciding with the opinion of Umar radiallahu anhu. The final uh, opinion which coincided with the ayat of the Quran was the prohibition of alcohol. The Sahab Umar radiallahu anhu himself, he was an alcoholic in his own words. He would drink, he would go, like we discussed last uh, week, the hadith which mentions he went for looking, he went looking for his clique, his friends who would sit. Like our brothers sit at the fast food joints and they would drink. Sadly, his friends are not there. Then he goes to the wine cellar, the best wine cellar in Makkah. He goes there and looks. He is out of wine. There are no stocks of wine. Then he goes and makes tawaf. Umar radiallahu anhu. But after he embraced Islam, he realized wine, alcohol is something evil. So he asks Allah, Ya Allah, Allahumma bayyin lana fil khamri bayanan shafiya. Oh Allah, time is up. We have drunk a lot of alcohol. We wasted a lot of our lives. Now give us a clear explanation about alcohol. Immediately Allah reveals verses prohibiting alcohol. Prohibiting alcohol from that time till this time. The alcohol has been prohibited for Muslims. So what were these we discussed? These were instances where Umar radiallahu anhu and the verses of the Quran coincided, were the same. Now, one of the greatest virtues of Umar radiallahu anhu is that he had thorough love for Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and after him for Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. They were friends, the best of friends. Listen to this incident, a very emotional an interesting incident. Abu Darda'i radiallahu anhu, he narrates that once there was some issue that took place between Abu Bakr and Umar. Their friends, friends argue, today there will be a dispute, tomorrow they will be shaking their hands. This is how our relationship should be with our friends. Not that we fight today and for years on end we remain without talking. Muhammad and Khalid fought. Muhammad will say, he only hurt me. I didn't hurt him, no? Let him come and speak. Khalid is thinking, 
Muhammad only hurt me. I didn't hurt him. Let Muhammad come and speak. Ego, inflated egos. But the Sahaba didn't have inflated egos. They had deflated egos. They did everything for the sake of Allah. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and Umar radiallahu anhu have a small argument. Now Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, out of, in the heat of the moment, he made a statement. He made a statement which made Umar radiallahu anhu angry. Our youngsters at the back, they can come forward. Please come forward. Please come forward. Yes, inshallah, you don't have any back problem. Come forward. Khair. So, um, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, in the heat of the moment, he said something that hurt Umar radiallahu anhu. Now, Umar radiallahu anhu is hurt. But Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, immediately he realizes that he had hurt Umar radiallahu anhu. So, immediately he goes to Umar radiallahu anhu and wants to seek the forgiveness of Umar radiallahu anhu. Umar radiallahu anhu, he is also angry, agitated. He shut the door on Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Now Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he is dejected, he is sad, he is sorrowful. He goes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He doesn't say anything, but Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Nabi of Allah, he realized my best friend is sad. My best friend is in grief. He asks Abu Bakr, your sahib, he tells the Sahaba, your companion Abu Bakr, he is upset today. He is upset. Then Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu explains, Ya Rasulullah, myself and Umar had an argument. I hastened in speech. I hurt him. And then I went to him. I sought his forgiveness, but he didn't forgive me, Ya Rasulullah. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu is sad. Perhaps if Umar doesn't forgive me, Allah won't forgive me. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, immediately he says, Oh Abu Bakr, may Allah forgive you. May Allah forgive you. May Allah forgive you. He says this thrice. Now, what do you think happened next? Immediately, Umar radiallahu anhu, he slammed the door shut on Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu when he went to him. But now Umar radiallahu anhu also is dejected. He is sad. He is sorrowful. And what happens next? He goes to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu's house, looking for him to patch up things immediately. But to his disappointment, alas, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu is not at his home. Where would Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu be? He didn't even ask anyone else. He didn't have to ask anyone else. He knew Abu Bakr would be either at home or in the masjid, in the company of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Umar radiallahu anhu rushes to the masjid. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is there. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is a little angry. He seems a little upset. Now Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu immediately he feels sorry for Umar radiallahu anhu. I have told, Prophet asked me, I have to tell him what happened. I have told the Prophet what happened. But now Umar has come. Perhaps the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa will scold him. Now Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu is feeling sorry for Umar radiallahu anhu. Immediately he kneels down and he says, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, it was my mistake. I am the one who wronged Umar twice. Don't do anything to him, Ya Rasulullah. This is the love and the bond and the friendship of Umar radiallahu anhu and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Ya Rasulullah, it was my mistake. Don't do anything to him. He defended his friend. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he came and defended Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu because Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was his best friend, his best supporter. When they made hijrah, they made hijrah together. When they passed away, they are buried next to each other. What did Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu get from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, when Allah sent me, when Allah sent me with Islam, when Allah made me the Prophet, all of y'all rejected me. But Abu Bakr, he accepted me, he supported me, he sympathized with me, he empathized with me, and he supported me with his family, he supported me with his wealth. Hereafter, no one should say anything to my friend Abu Bakr. 
Thereafter, Umar radiallahu anhu, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, they were like they were before. There was no hard feelings. Today we have an argument. Our arguments last for decades. Even between brothers, they might pray in the same masjid. They will pray in the same saf, but they won't pray next to each other. Why inflated egos? And mostly the issues are because of money. Because of money. This was the epitome of true friendship. This is how Umar radiallahu anhu and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu were. This is how important they were for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now Umar radiallahu anhu throughout his life in Islam, he supported the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam thoroughly. Now the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is living his last moments. The last moments of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this world, the God of all, all creation, he passed away. He passed on to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum are dejected. They are demotivated. The mood in Medina is dark, it's somber. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born, the Arabian Peninsula was enlightened. The mountains were shining. But when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away, the mood in Medina was somber. The mood in Medina was dark. The Sahaba did not know what to do. Umar radiallahu anhu, he comes to the Sahaba. They are mentioning that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has now passed away. What does Umar radiallahu anhu say? If any one of you mention that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has passed away, I will kill you. You will deal with my sword. You will have to face my sword. If you mention that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has passed away, you will face my sword. Umar radiallahu anhu could not digest the fact that the greatest of Allah's creation was no longer amongst them. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was far away. He was a little far away. He had gone to his other house in, uh, in the outskirts of Medina. He gets the news of the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He comes to Medina. He goes, he checks on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He kisses the forehead of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He realizes that the Prophet sallallahu 